Cool. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third and final day of the APA National Capital Area Chapter 2021 Annual Conference. I'm Nick Kushner. I'm an APA at-large board member um, and really excited for this morning's session. Um, remember that you can check out all of our sessions. We've uploaded um, the recordings from both the pre-recorded sessions as well as the sessions from the previous two days on our website at ncac.planning.org. Um, also remember to follow us on Twitter. Um, we're using the hashtag NCAC21. So today we have three additional sessions throughout the day. We have this morning session, which I'll introduce in a second. Um, and then we have at 12 o'clock, the path to community engagement, the road best traveled. And then at four o'clock, we have our law credit session, land use law updates. Uh, and that is worth 1.5 credits. Um, so this morning, uh, we have a great panel for you. Uh, we have the night bus leveraging big data and targeted engagement for equitable late night transit planning. So really excited to, to hear this, uh, this presentation and um, very early in the morning to hear a presentation about late night transit planning. Um, this is available for one credit. Uh, so you can claim your credits on the APA website uh, at the completion of the session. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Nick Adamo from Kimley Horn, who's gonna kick us off and introduce the rest of the panel. All right, uh, thank you, Nick. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our session uh, titled The Night Bus, Leveraging Big Data and Targeted Engagement for Equitable Late Night Transit Planning. Uh, we'd like to thank the National Capital Area Chapter and the 2021 Virtual Conference organizers for hosting us today. And uh, thanks to you all as well for your interest in this session and for joining us. This session will provide uh, an overview of the late night mobility study. This effort of uh, the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, also known as WMATA or Metro, was a research study that sought to better understand late night and early morning uh, transit travel markets throughout the region. My name is Nick Adamo. I am a transportation planner at Kimley Horn of DC. And I was a member of the consultant team on this late night mobility study. I am uh, excited to be joined by two of my study teammates today, Melissa Kim from the Metro Office of Planning and Lucas Muller, my colleague here at Kimley Horn of DC who will help to provide an overview of this effort and how the team was able to make really good use of big data and targeted stakeholder and uh, rider engagement to complete this research study and craft strategies that will inform future transit service planning decisions at Metro. Um, I will now pass it off to my teammates to uh, introduce themselves, uh, Melissa. Good morning, everyone, and thanks again for joining us today. I'm Melissa Kim, and as Nick mentioned, I'm a senior planner in Metro's Office of Planning, and I was the Metro Project Manager for this study. All right, and good morning. Uh, my name is Lucas Muller. I'm a mobility planner with uh, Kimberly Horn of DC. Uh, been working in the field for about 10 years and had the pleasure to work on a lot of uh, mobility planning initiatives um, within the greater DC region uh, and work with a lot of transit agencies uh, in Northern Virginia, uh, DC and, and Maryland. And this was uh, one of the most kind of unique and, and exciting studies uh, that we've gotten to be a part of. So looking forward to sharing some of it with you today. Great, thanks, Melissa. Thank you, Lucas. Today's session will walk you through an overview of the study, its process, purpose, and outcomes, as well as a summary of findings, opportunities, and recommendations for enhanced late night and early morning transit service. We are really excited to have a great group of planners and practitioners in the audience today, and we have built in uh, several breaks in the presentation to get feedback, have some discussions, and field your questions. I will now pass it off to Lucas, who will provide an overview of the late night mobility study. Thanks, Nick. Um, so yeah, I wanna give a little bit of background and, and overview to the study, and then we'll dive in a little bit into uh, the weeds of, of what we studied here. Um, go to the next slide here. So let's rewind back a little bit to late 2019, 
uh, early 2020, transit ridership trends uh, had been recovering um, from some lows over previous years. Uh, COVID wasn't a thing yet, at least in the US. Um, and we were embarking on this study to uh, examine an understudy of a critical sector of our, our transit network. Uh, Metro decided to conduct the late night mobility study uh, to better understand late night and early morning um, transportation markets throughout the region. Uh, represents a complete look at travel needs between 11 p.m. and 5 a.m., uh, including how and where people uh, want to go, the existing transit service network, and also the unique needs of the customers and riders who are traveling uh, during this period. Uh, and what we really sought to achieve was a broader understanding of late night and early morning travel um, that would inform future service decisions for Metro um, and ways to uh, inform engagement uh, with the community. Um, so why, why was it important to look at late night uh, and early morning service? Um, first, late night uh, and early morning transit service really provides a vital link to uh, economic mobility. Uh, some of you may have seen the uh, DDOT um, or DC government uh, report on the late night economy and the critical nature of that. This was coming right on the heels um, of that report. Um, high, um, high transportation costs can lead to financial stress uh, on late night workers or exclude potential workers from taking advantage of late shift jobs. Uh, the annual median wage uh, of a late shift worker is $30,000, uh, 5,000 less than the median pay uh, for, gen for, for daytime workers. Uh, we're also seeing a growth in late night uh, late shift uh, employment. Uh, the largest sectors that make up late shift work, such as healthcare, food services, hospitalities, uh, are expected to grow faster than overall employment uh, during the next uh, five to 10 years. Also had a lot of new data available. Um, historically in transit planning, you know, a lot of times there's a, a, an over, there's a focus on uh, peak travel and during the day. Um, but and historically, the needs of, of late night, early morning travelers have been difficult to analyze. Um, but using new data sources, uh, things like Streetlight, other global uh, GPS uh, location data, um, and, a, and new uh, metro data uh, itself, um, can better understand the when and the where of how transit um, can effectively serve existing uh, and potential unmet needs uh, for travel during this time period, uh, improving transit service for the people who need it most. Um, and finally, as we as we, this study progressed and we did get into the peak of COVID, we realized you know it was it was even more clear that many of the late night and early morning travelers are really these essential workers um, that we relied on so much during COVID and will continue um, to rely on. It really highlighted the need to provide safe and reliable transit choices uh, for these populations. So we took a multifaceted approach to assess the demand for late night transit service and identify gaps. Uh, it was important to look at both uh, data, but also have real conversations um, with people who travel during that period. Um, so together, um, the technical demand analysis and the stakeholder and late night customer input fed into identification of late night gaps in the development of study recommendations. Uh, at key points in the process, we met with a large, uh, wide group of internal WMATA stakeholders to craft an effective outreach strategy uh, and gain feedback on developing recommendations. Uh, we worked with the communications department, we worked with the uh, engagement, we worked with the service planners, we looked at, uh, worked with um, uh, engineers and, and many groups um, within WMATA. Uh, and the range of study uh, recommendations included service-related recommendations, uh, so changes to existing service or potentially new service, uh, as well as non-service recommendations, such as marketing, communications, uh, infrastructure and safety, as well as technology. So uh, the study kicked off in September 2019, as I mentioned prior to pandemic. Uh, the outreach was planned for mid-March, um, so I remember when we had to do the postponement um, and, and try to, to shift our gears, um, we had to figure out how to reach uh, these 
the, the populations uh, that were traveling during this time. Uh, and we need to start adjusting the rippling effects uh, of the pandemic. Um, thankfully, we were able to work with uh, with WMATA's customer uh, engagement team. Uh, most of our stakeholders and customers were able to participate in outreach using uh, an online platform like this, um, which is commonplace to us now, but was very new um, in March of 2020. Um, and so we ended up doing uh, focus groups uh, via Zoom, which were very effective. We'll get into those a little bit later. Um, and But we weren't able to do our um, in-person outreach or our uh, uh, out, op, operator outreach, talking to the specific uh, riders as well, or, or sorry, the operators. Uh, the pandemic didn't have any effect on the specific recommendations that were put forward, um, but what it did is shifted the implementation timeframe um, in terms of when the recommendations might go into play. Um, since we we're offering very limited, since offering very limited uh, late night service and the studies completed, uh, implementation timeframes uh, suggested were based on uh, return to previous levels uh, late night service. Um, so now I'm going to dive into a little bit of the uh, the data analysis and and the way that we approached it from a technical side, um, and then we'll pause for some questions um, or. Uh, discussion items. Um, so if you do have any uh, questions or thoughts or reactions as we're going to this, uh, please put these into the, the chat um, and we'll be able to address those uh, in a few minutes here. Um, but so previous studies concluded that nationally, um, the late night economy is a significant portion of many communities overall uh, economic activity and health, uh, both for businesses and workers. Uh, in the district, late night activity accounts for almost 65,000 jobs and 7.1 billion in, uh, in annual revenue. Um, however, late night transportation barriers are a major concern for late night workers and businesses. Uh, the former already a socioeconomically disadvantaged group um, compared to their daytime peers. Um, an analysis of the Washington DC's region demographics related to the busiest late night travel patterns shown um, a higher proportion of people of color and lower educational uh, attain attainment level as well. Um, one of the unique uh, approaches here uh, that our partner uh, on this study, uh, Foursquare ITP, uh, conducted was they used uh, a, a web scraping method from Google uh, to pull locations of venues or activity centers uh, that were prominent indicators of late night transit, such as uh, bars, restaurants, sports venues, hospitals, uh, things like uh, elements like that where you know, if you were to try to manually identify all those locations, that would take um, weeks and months, um, but we were able to automate that process to really pinpoint where some of those um, generators are. Uh, the needs assessment analyzed uh, hourly travel patterns uh, across all modes using streetlight data. We used hourly bus uh, travel patterns uh, using uh, WMATA's uh, uh, WMATA's own data, uh, late night transit propensity uh, based on a lot of those late night indicators I was just mentioning, um, as well as existing uh, late night transit supply. So what services out there as well. Um, we also were able to use uh, some data from the, the TNCs, uh, Uber, Lyft, uh, other uh, private transportation providers in our analysis as well. So there was a lot, was a lot that came out of this um, to hit on some of the, the key findings that we saw um, that travel flows, regardless of mode, um, unsurprisingly generally decreased through the night. Um, the low point was between approximately 1 a.m. Uh, and 3 a.m. And that's when you start to see it ramp up again towards uh, the, the morning travel. Um, as we'll see on the next slide, it was also interesting to see what, um, how those patterns differed on the weeknights uh, versus the weekends. Um, what you see here in this map um, with the various lines and the shaded areas are the relative densities of, of overall travel flows. Um, so again, this is using uh, streetlight data, which uh, anonymously uh, reports uh, cell phone uh, positioning data to show the trip patterns. Um, so you can see some of those, the larger density, the red and the darker um, grays, which show the internal uh, trips to specific zones. We identified 
uh, about 50 zones throughout the, the greater uh, DC region uh, and looked at the travel patterns uh, in between those. Um, we also looked at the proportions of late night trips uh, uh, compared to overall trips by geography and generally found that those proportions are higher uh, in areas with lower income and uh, higher concentrations of minority populations as well. Um, so on these graphs, um, what you see in the gray line is the number of uh, overall trips uh, based on the streetlight data by hour. Um, and then on the bar graphs, you see the transit as well as TNC trips on the bar graphs. So what's interesting here, and you have the weekday travel patterns on the left and the weekend travel patterns on the right. Um, and so what was interesting to us here is that the Largely the trends are the same um, in, those, um, in those graphs, um, but we do see a, during the, the weekday, there is a higher, um, I would say, to, uh, mode share, mode split um, of those trips um, compared to the overall trips. Um, so during the weekday, um, late night trips on Metro bus or Metro rail account for approximately 33 um, 34 percent of weekday trips um, between 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. and then during the weekend that's about eight uh, percent of, of the trips. Um, so um, we're going to pause here want to um, see a lot of folks uh, in the audience wanting to see uh, if there are any kind of dis uh, discussion points or questions um, that you all have about the overall study um, or about some of the, um, the, the data points that were raised um, or, or studied. Um, so some potential prompts here, uh, and again, please put these uh, either in the chat or uh, using the Q&A feature. Um, have you ever ridden uh, the bus or train at these late night hours? How does your experience differ um, from, from, during, from daytime travel? What are some of the other ways of uh, late night and early morning riders uh, you think need to be met? Um, do you have any questions or clarifications about the project or analysis? Um, what other trends would you might uh, be interested in, in looking at? Um, so just some, some thought prompts there. We'd love to get some engagement and some, uh, some discussion here if possible. Pause here. Anyone want to be a, a, a helpful volunteer to uh, submit a question or, or an idea? So I think we got um, we got a question in the Q and A. Um, oh, but it's it's half typed out. So do you know the proportion of something? So uh, if whoever typed that, you could finish up your your question. Um, I was just going to ask for clarification, though. So the the time frame of the data that you looked at was uh, from when to when. Um, so we largely looked at about a year of data, um, and this was all pre-COVID data. So this okay. was quite a uh, bit mainly 2019, uh, 2019 data. OK, great. And then um, so, OK, um, Buffy Ellis has completed the question. Do you know the proportion of TNC trips on weekend nights? I do not have that number uh, at, uh, offhand. We can probably look back and see if that was included uh, in the study. Um, there, are, you can kind of see roughly the um, the the so the the on the slide that's shown on the screen here. Um, the top bar, the top purple-ish bar, is the TNC trips. You can kind of see. Um, those uh, generally um, there. So I don't have an exact number, but those are kind of the overall trend there. And really quickly, I'll, I'll add that one of the tough things about the TNC data is that we only had it for DC. And that's why it ended up not being a larger part of our study because the study was for the entire region. And I think there's only a data sharing agreement within the District of Columbia. So the numbers that you see reflected here are only for DC rather than for the entire region, which is what the rest of the data represents. Um, another question from the Q&A, did you mention the time period that you gathered the streetlight data for? 
So uh, that was also a, a similar time frame. Um, it was basically 12 months of data um, through, I, I believe it was, when, the latest was uh, October 2019, I believe. So a year uh, back from that. Um, and then how do you account for the fact that late night use of transit is affected by the lack of transit service? It's a great question. So, I mean, there are a, a bunch of different ways that we wanted to look at this. I mean, one is one is understanding what is being used. Nick, if you can go back to slide uh, eight, um, you know, one of the things is that the we need to address that the supply. Uh, what are the levels of supply that are out there? Um, we also That's one of the reasons also we wanted to look at the overall amount of trips that are happening, not just transit trips, so that we can understand where there might be um, room to grow that transit mode share, um, as well as looking at specific locations where we think that that use there might be a lot of uh, late night trips, but not necessarily transit service. So we'll get a little bit into that more uh, when we talk about the recommendations and, and how we looked at gaps. I'll quickly um, add that just as Lucas mentioned, the exciting part of this study for us is that we had data available on all trips that were being made. And that's something that was new for us. Uh, so we did try to rely on, on that as part of the study, even though it, that is a good point that people could be suppressing rec recreation trips. Um, because they aren't able to, to get somewhere and can't afford a car. But that's that's how we tried to get around it. Using this, uh, this information on all trips was really exciting for us. Um, another couple of questions in, in the Q&A. Uh, was there any engagement with late night employers or employees as part of the study? Yes, absolutely. That is, a, we, Nick is going to talk about that um, next. Um, so we'll pause on that question and come back to that. Great. And then I think the last question uh, for this break, uh, what tool was used to cluster, identify the areas with late night trips? Was it proximity to restaurants, bars, hospitals, et cetera? Um, yes. So um, I don't have the all the exact specifics of it, but basically it was using um, some web scraping with big uh, Google Maps to identify uh, specific point locations of uh, actual uh, businesses or uh, specific areas and then doing kind of a, a cluster analysis and density of where those uh, locations were. Uh, the, the map that's actually on the screen here um, does show kind of the concentration of a lot of those um, a lot of those areas. And then in the chat Richard asked uh, any info that breaks down who the employers are by NAICs in size. Yes, um, I believe that that was additional, that was part of the uh, information um, when we looked at overall uh, jobs as well, uh, of which of those types um, of employers were, were classified uh, as late night. Uh, so. Great. Right. So all the well, questions we have right now. Uh, great, great questions. Thanks for the uh, engagement. We'll have a, another pause for questions uh, after the engagement slide. So get those get those ready and I'll turn it over to Nick. Yes, great questions and thank you, Lucas. Um, so as we mentioned um, in our introduction, a really critical component of this study was the study team's understanding of late night and early morning transit travel patterns and needs um, uh, through public engagement and outreach. Through discussions with Metro's Office of External Relations, the study team determined that direct stakeholder and customer meetings would enable uh, a much deeper discussion about late night travel challenges and decision making factors, as well as uh, priorities. This information uh, can be typically difficult to collect and fully understand via surveys or other outreach efforts. And uh, the team also developed a set of goals uh, shown here on the screen for the outreach effort in order to drive the development of our outreach approach, as well as meeting materials and discussion questions uh, to our stakeholders and uh, customers. The study's approach to engagement was intended to solicit information from 
segments of the population that are more likely to travel during the late night and early morning hours, as well as community-based organizations, industry associations, and business improvement districts um, that really represent um, these populations, such as uh, late night travelers, stakeholders that represent uh, a large number of late night workers, such as major employers, industry associations, trade unions, and uh, uh, nightlife uh, restaurant owners, um, hotel and hospitality management, et cetera, um, as well as transit riders uh, represented by community-based organizations and advocacy groups. Based on discussions and previous research, it was determined that the industries with the highest concentrations of late night travelers are healthcare, food services, hospitality and leisure, um, as well as maintenance and custodial services. Due to the size of the study area, effectively the entirety of Metro's service area, it was determined that working with stakeholder groups that represent these industries in smaller group settings would be uh, the most effective way to gain diverse perspectives. Uh, without co conducting the more research, uh, resource intensive and costly region wide efforts uh, to large numbers of customers. As noted earlier, the study's outreach approach was crafted in uh, late 2019 and early 2020, which uh, did coincide with the rather disruptive uh, global event of the pandemic. And in a rather short period of time, the study team shifted its approach to uh, have our outreach occur entirely virtually, making use of the Zoom video conference platform and its really handy built-in tools for polling questions and breakout groups. The outreach and coordination conducted in this study was able to recruit uh, nearly 30 total stakeholder representatives who participated across three 90-minute virtual small group discussions. And uh, while the icons of the stakeholder organizations met with shown here is not an exhaustive list of those involved, it does represent the three categories of stakeholders uh, that we met with and the wide range of organizations that contributed to this study. Through the study team's coordination with uh, Metro staff and their Office of Customer Research, it was determined that uh, one additional small group meeting with actual late night transit riders and customers would be feasible and would lead to the collection of additional valuable insight for the study. Customer participants uh, in this small group meeting included frequent users of both late night Metro bus and Metro rail service and represented a um, broad geographic cross section of the district and uh, the surrounding areas. Five customer participants were residents of the district uh, representing several different wards and neighborhoods and two customer participants were residents of nearby Maryland communities in Prince George's County. Across the three stakeholder small group discussions and the one customer small group discussion, several broad and overarching themes received um, some attention and overlap, um, interest and discussion. It was found that the uh, late night mobility needs of current Metro customers are not being met uh, as well as they could be. It was found that in general, travel during off peak and weekend periods is seen as more difficult than peak period and weekday travel. Transit reliability during the late night period is a critical component of local and regional economic vitality, as well as employee retention. The affordability of travel is another common concern for our customers. Uh, and this was uh, found to be especially true for those in minority communities. There is a um, uh, general consensus that higher frequency and greater reliability of service is needed to encourage greater use and reliance of transit during the late night period. And unsurprisingly, uh, safety and security was a very common concern, uh, especially among women um, at bus stops, uh, transit stations, and onboard transit. Regarding how transit riders we talked with make decisions on whether or not to travel during the late night period, several key takeaways were found. Um, 
reliability and affordability were among the most commonly stated key decision-making factors. Late night trips are highly variable for many late night workers with uh, typical trips being very rare during this late night period. And uh, late night employees have a stated preference for taking transit rather, rather than uh, driving a personal vehicle or ride hailing, but due to concerns of reliability and convenience, uh, they find it hard to opt for transit. Regarding awareness and communication of late night transit options, it was found that uh, accurate and reliable real time information is in high demand. Many participants find that late night real time information uh, can be unreliable or incorrect, uh, more so than during the day. There are opportunities to leverage relationships with community partners across the region to effectively disseminate information, uh, as well as opportunities to work with uh, late night employers who can uh, work to share information about travel options to their employees. Regarding the mode specific choices around bus and rail options, the study team learned that uh, some late night travelers tend to avoid metro bus trips because they perceive routes and schedules to be more complicated in comparison to metro rail. There is pretty strong support for a dedicated late night bus network. Stakeholder representatives, um, it was found uh, maybe less informed about um, available bus transit options than actual customers themselves. And there is a strong opportunity to better coordinate the timing of transfers, both uh, from bus to bus and rail to bus. Regarding public private, private partnerships, uh, there were pretty mixed feelings. Those who expressed interest in this uh, concept noted that uh, if pursued to meet late night travel needs, these partnerships uh, should supplement and not replace late night transit. There was a broad concern regarding the cost of such partnerships, both costs for the user and for Metro as an agency. And it was seen that uh, first and last mile connections are seen as a, a good opportunity for um, potential mobility partnerships. Several different types of service and fare related potential solutions were discussed and identified among our stakeholders and customers, including um, ideas around longer running and more frequent service across all modes during the late night hours. A common theme heard across all groups was that uh, the bus network is perceived as more difficult to understand during the late night hours. Some stakeholders and riders suggested simplified route alignments to make the bus network more accessible to late night travelers. The creation of a night bus network was seen as a solution um, as long as the network is simple, clear, and well marketed. Timed transfers both uh, between bus and rail and bus to bus were highlighted by customers as a particular solution that would make uh, late night travel more convenient. The people we met with, uh, both from uh, customers and stakeholders, also discussed many other types of potential solutions, including those around communications, partnerships, and data. Um, several stakeholders cautioned that uh, potential language barriers among diverse customers and stakeholders should be considered when developing communications materials. Some participants also noted that there is an opportunity to market the benefits of late night public transit as a safe alternative to driving. Customers noted that it is really critical for real-time data to be accurate during the late night and early morning hours. And in general, the idea of partnerships with services like Uber and Lyft uh, were of less interest among participants with uh, many folks expressing a concern about the potential cost of such partnerships. And as noted before, if pursued, there is a desire for these partnerships to supplement the late night transit network. Um, for example, improving first and last mile connections to transit rather than replacing any transit service. These major ideas and takeaways from our participants really provided a strong uh, guidance for the study team and its development of these study recommendations.
And despite the sudden setback of the pandemic and really suddenly being thrust into an all virtual environment, the study team was able to exercise flexibility and creativity to really seamlessly carry on with the planned outreach component. Uh, Melissa, any other thoughts or additions on the outreach process? Yeah, the one thing that I would add is just how important having this opportunity to speak more in depth with both customers and stakeholders was in the recommendation development process. Because as Nick mentioned, oftentimes we conduct large survey efforts or have other outreach where we don't get to understand the why people are making the decisions that they did. And so I just wanted to say that at Metro, we were really happy with the way that the team worked with our outreach, uh, our external relations group and customer research to really make this a robust outreach effort that ultimately informed a lot of the especially non-service recommendations that we put forward as part of the study. Yeah, Melissa, I think that was, it was definitely a, a quality over quantity item. I, we were able to, through, I guess, through the smart trip data, we're able to specifically reach out to people that we knew were traveling in that time period. So the people that we got in our focus groups were, you know, the, they were they were informed and the right people. It's not just like we there was six people or that we picked, you know, these were specifically targeted and really insightful and interesting stories to, to share. All right, uh, so at this point, I think we can break for another Q&A session. So we have one question um, in the Q&A. Uh, curious to know if the virtual public engagement platform is something that should be adopted by the industry for the future. How is your experience with it and what advantages, disadvantages do you think this offers planning and public outreach efforts for future projects? I can start and then Nick and Lucas, if you want to give a perspective from someone from a, people who are engaged with multiple outreach efforts with uh, multiple projects, you can jump on in. But I think from our perspective, this is a great question and something we're thinking about a lot. I, I work in the Office of Planning, so I don't necessarily, uh, my, my expertise is not outreach. We have an entire team that are really the outreach experts um, and they'd probably be able to answer this question better. But this is something that I think we're going to continue to do into the future. I think there's a recognition that it needs to be paired with in-person outreach where we're going to where people are and we can uh, reach more populations because there are certain segments of the population that are left out by virtual outreach. But on the flip side, it is easier for people to come to. You don't need to take the bus. You don't need to drive whatever it is to get to the meeting. You don't need to find childcare. So, Ultimately, this is something that I think across the country will be continuing in some form as a way to reach people that is more convenient uh, and has fewer barriers. And then Lucas, Nick, if either of you want to add um, from the consultant side, your perspective. Sure. I mean, I, I would agree. I, I think I see it absolutely as one of the tools in the toolbox that will continue for, for a comprehensive use of, of outreach and engagement. Um, I think it's important that it's, it's used well and used clearly. Uh, I think we've learned a lot of lessons um, in the past year and a half of, of you know, how to, at, at first we were like, oh, th you know, this is, this is so much easier than doing a public meeting. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to print boards. You don't have to do this. Um, but there's just as much logistics and practice and prep of making sure that you have clear messaging. Uh, people are able to access the platform that you craft uh, engaging and creative questions. Um, and that there are those in-person opportunities as well uh, for folks who don't have access or choose not to um, join in, in that setting. So. Overall, I'd say one, an important tool that I see will continue, but not a replacement for uh, in-person outreach, um, but a, a really great way to engage more people that you might not um, have been able to uh, in the past, um, but ensuring to maintain that the, um, 
digital digital divide is is acknowledged and um, having those bus stop chats things like that at the uh, at the actual locations of the service. At the expense of being repetitive, uh, I will also agree. Um, I think there's a lot of interest from the industry practitioners and planners like ourselves, um, as well as our audiences and participants and maintaining some component of virtual outreach. Uh, but as both Melissa and Lucas noted, um, there are some implications and considerations. Uh, the digital divide is a term that comes up a lot. Um, you know, we need to be mindful that not everyone has access to a computer or an internet connection. Um, and some people are just naturally less uh, tech savvy. Um, and um, while virtual engagement can really help reach a broader audience, um, you know, if you record meetings, you can post them later, folks can watch after time. Um, I think there remains a strong uh, opportunity for and need for that in-person engagement. Um, meeting people where they are in the community um, is a really powerful tool, it always has been. And um, I think uh, that well-balanced approach that Lucas noted, um, I think uh, can and should and will uh, remain the focus. So we got another question in the in the Q and A. Um, how did you know that you were actually reaching a representative group of, for example, working women who do not speak English? So is there a way you guys assessed that? We yeah. did work. Oh, Lucas, so you can I'm go ahead, and I'll go second. <laughs> okay, I was going to say, um, so, you know, I would say that the, the outreach of this effort was not necessarily a, a statistically representative uh, group. I think one of the ways that we tried to, what we strive to be as representative as possible is through the use uh, and engagement with different stakeholders. Um, we, one of the, the lessons learned and one of the things that Melissa will, will hit on in her is, is, is how we and Metro can help to leverage uh, a lot of these groups going forward and really using them as outlets um, to convey and communicate information, whether that be service information or future engagement opportunities. Um, these, these stakeholders and these organizations have the best and clearest lines of communications and frankly trust um, with their representatives um, and, and the people that they uh, engage with. And so the, the more we can build relationships um, with these stakeholders and making sure that they're helping and being advocates for getting the messaging out um, and getting feedback the other way too um, is really important. Melissa, feel free to add on to that. I think Lucas hit the nail on the head, so I'll leave it there. Great, I'm not seeing anything else in the Q&A or the chat right now, so maybe we can carry on, go forward. Oh, wait, we just got a, another one in the Q&A. Um, what was the time frame for community engagement? Did it continue during the recommendation stages and so forth? The time frame for the recommendation, or the, excuse me, the engagement was really during the, the data gathering phase and understanding of gaps. So we, we did not go back out with the recommendations, partially because, as Nick mentioned earlier, this really was a research study to try to understand what the needs were and then be able to use that information to uh, engage internally about the need for funding and potentially expanded resources for, for this type of service. So we did not go back out to the stakeholders with the recommendations to discuss it. Although during each of the sessions we did discuss, we, we left a good chunk of time to discuss potential recommendations that they would like to see. And those ultimately did make it into the, the recommendations for, for a, a large part. And there's and Melissa, right? There's been a lot of engagement too, just with with those stakeholders and and doing presentations to other uh, entities as well, just to uh, continue the momentum of this, right? Yes, there has been uh, engagement with other external stakeholders, not necessarily these exact same targeted groups, but we have continued conversations uh, forward. Again, largely as a way to um, understand external support and. Uh, and leverage that for potential um, internal support for expanding resources for this type of service.
All right, great outreach questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm not seeing any more in the chat, um, so we can move on. Uh, going to pass it off to Melissa now. Sure, we have one more question, but if it's okay, Marlo, we'll get to that after this section, if that works. Um, so quickly, I'm going to kind of combine what Lucas and Nick both talked about and, and talk about how we use that as identifying opportunities for improvements. So you can go to the next slide. To identify gaps between supply and demand, the study area was broken into the 50 zones that Lucas spoke about earlier. And for each possible trip between zones, the team compared the demand for transit to the supply of transit across every hour of the late night period. And this resulted in over 2000 transit gaps. Uh, and those were then filtered just to make sure that we could develop meaningful and concentrated recommendations. Really quickly, examples of filters that were used for this prior prioritization are the number of trips occurring between the two zones uh, and the number of hours that a gap existed between the zone pairs so that we could focus on zone pairs with gaps for longer time periods. Next slide. As a result of the prioritization, we ended up with 18 connection gaps and those are shown on the map on this slide as blue lines between zones and then five internal circulation gaps that are shown in uh, as the blue polygons. That just means that the trip started and ended in, in that zone. So you can see most of the gaps begin or end in the district and common endpoints for those gaps are the district core, the zone that contains Hugh Street and the zone that contains Noma and Ivy City. Outside of the district, Bladensburg and National Harbor also were the start point of various connection gaps. And we found that Many of the gaps start or end in zones that have high concentrations of people with low incomes uh, and people of color. You can go to the next slide. So now I'm gonna talk quickly about some of the proposed benefits and solutions. Next slide. The project's recommendations were organized into three phases of implementation, short-term, mid-term, and long-term. And these timelines were based off of a return to previous levels of late night service, as I think Lucas mentioned earlier, because of the uncertainty of when and how service would continue to change over the course of the pandemic. The short-term recommendations were suggested to occur within six to 12 months of a return to previous levels of late night service, and these uh, are cost neutral. The midterm recommendations would occur within 12 to 18 months of a return to previous levels of late night service. And those would result in a 5% increase in late night revenue hours. And then finally, the long-term recommendations would occur 18 or more months after a return to previous levels of service and would result in a 15% increase in late night revenue hours compared to pre-pandemic service. And each of these different phases of implementation focus on specific types of recommendations that ultimately uh, by the end of the long-term implementation would create a holistic late night network. Next slide. The short-term recommendations included span and frequency changes for several current routes, uh, routes excuse me, that were meant to optimize resources and cover high priority gaps in the late night system. And these recommendations also included reductions in a couple of unproductive routes. So there were several routes that serve between two and five passengers per trip during the late night hours. So the study recommended terminating service on these routes at 11 p.m. and then reinvesting those, those service hours into areas where there are significant gaps. As I'll speak to more in a second, there were also short-term recommendations that, in, that were strategies to improve the customer experience. Uh, for the midterm, the recommendations would build on the short-term recommendations by expanding service further until at least 2 a.m. and in many cases to 3 a.m. or later to cover additional high priority gaps in the late night system. Midterm recommendations also included some additional communication and marketing strategies. And then long-term recommendations would result in a fully dedicated late night transit system with its own branding. And these recommendations would require a significant increase in infrastructure and operation costs. Um, recommendations in general also included consideration for extended weekday metro rail hours. Um, and I'll discuss that more in a little bit. So next slide, please. 
Based on a review of best practices and on stakeholder and customer feedback, the study team developed a number of non-service recommendations. And these would be, um, they would end up enhancing Metro's existing late night service and the proposed late night service. Um, the recommended strategies are also organized into short, medium and long-term timelines. So for the short term, one of the recommendations is to develop a late night network map to make it easy and clear to understand Metro's existing late night service. An example of Muni's late night map is shown on the right of this slide here. Another recommendation is to evaluate and implement a flag stop policy. And these types of policies are used by King County Metro, TransLink in Vancouver, BC, and some others who have late night uh, bus service. And if you're unfamiliar, this type of policy allows riders to ask the operator operator to be allowed off at any point along the route during designated late night hours, even if it's not a bus stop. And this policy is intended to make sure that late night customers feel safe traveling at night and that they're able to get off closer to their destination. As Nick mentioned at length, better coordinating the timing of transfers between late night buses and between Metro bus and Metro rail was noted as something that is really important by the study stakeholders. And we understand from the stakeholder interviews and talking to customers that improving timing of these transfers would impact both safety and affordability of trips for many of these customers. Fewer customers would have to wait long periods of time in the dark for the next bus. And then along the same lines, fewer customers would have to resort to walking long distances to their final destination or turning to expensive ride sharing services as a last resort to get home. So that was something that we felt needed to be implemented in the short term. And then a final short term recommendation was to continue to advance current metro initiatives that are working on improving data accuracy and availability and looking specifically at late night for that effort. Next slide. One of the medium term recommendations is to establish branding for our late night services. Uh, several peer agencies like King County Metro, CTA in Chicago, and Muni in the Bay Area, they have adopted late night branding that helps highlight the differences between late night and daytime services. And this really increases the visibility of the routes that operate at late night. So this strategy would build off of the map that was described in the near-term recommendations. Another recommendation is to create a public facing webpage that would serve as a sort of repository for key information and communication about late night transit service. And having this type of webpage would increase awareness and understanding of our late night service. And with this type of platform in place, stakeholder groups, community-based organizations, they would be able to access maps, flyers, and other information and distribute the information to their constituents, which came up again and again in our outreach. And then the final recommendation is to install lighting at bus stops, something that came up often in, in the, especially the customer outreach was the risk of not being seen by bus approaching bus operators while waiting at a dark bus stop. So this solution would address that issue and, and also the general safety concerns experienced by late night riders. Next slide. As of June, Metro extended service on 36 of our routes to 2 a.m. And that was really exciting for us. Many of those routes were recommended for span frequency increases in, in this study. And you can see on the right uh, a map of, of this 2 a.m. late night network. Uh, another big change that was implemented this fall was the extension of Metro Rail service to 12 a.m. on weekdays and 1 a.m. on weekends. Uh, while Metrobus was identified as the most appropriate solution to fill the 18 gaps that were identified as part of the study, it did note that there needed to be further analysis of extending Metro Rail service to, to later hours. So that was really exciting. And then just, just to wrap up for implementation, while the extension of late night service through 2 a.m. is a great start for our late night network, um, the study found that there is demand for service past 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. and even 24 hours on some routes. And those recommendations aren't yet planned for implementation, but Internally, we're going to continue to push for additional late night service as ridership continues to return and stabilize, and also as we're able to get an understanding of how ridership is doing on our current 2 a.m. network. 
Next slide. All right, and then to wrap up really quickly, gonna review a few of the lessons learned. You can go to the next slide. We learned a number of valuable lessons at the close of the outreach process specifically, and many of those were the result of the need to draft, drastically shift our approach and the venue to an all virtual format because of the pandemic. So first we found that virtual meeting functionality worked pretty well and actually felt personal and reduced barriers to participation. Something that is key to note is that messaging before the meeting that provided instructions for download and use of any virtual meeting platform, again, we, we use Zoom, was critical in making sure that people were able to attend the meeting on the day of the meeting. Uh, we also had a point of contact for all technology issues and that point of contact was actually used several times. So it really allowed issues that, that um, stakeholders and customers were having to get into the Zoom meeting be resolved in an efficient manner, which was pretty important. We found that some stakeholder representatives may have been biased by their own thoughts or perceptions, as opposed to speaking on behalf of their constituents, which is not entirely surprising, but nonetheless, the feedback was really valuable to gain perspectives of target neighborhoods, industries, advocacy groups, and, and to try to build relationships for future engagement opportunities and communication. And we found that the addition of the late night customer small group meeting was pretty critical to gain insights into an individual, the individual rider's perspective and to hear firsthand accounts about the challenges uh, faced travel during this time period. Uh, we also found that virtual small group meeting rooms were pretty effective for targeted discussions of decision making factors, trade offs, and potential solutions. And as we spoke about a little bit earlier, this really was critical. And as you can see from the non service recommendations, they they really did inform a lot of the recommendations that that came out of this study. And then I think this is our final pause for questions. That's great. Um, so I think we have a couple questions, one in the chat, and we have just a couple minutes left. Um, so I know Marlo had asked earlier, um, was there any information or notation about homeless people who ride the bus at night? This was an issue identified in California. This didn't come up in any of our stakeholder meetings. That may have been something that we could have identified during our uh, discussions with operators. Unfortunately, we we ended up not having those. So this wasn't something we looked at specifically in the study, but is, is a good point to note. And then um, another question in the Q&A, with the request to stop policy, does that increase liability for public transportation providers? For example, if someone is not dropped off at a permanent bus stop set by a transportation provider and something happens to that rider? That's a, another great question. It's it's something that I think we wanted to talk more. So the next step, the recommendation was really to study the implementation of that. So we'd have to speak with union representatives. We'd have to spend a lot of time with bus planning to understand the implications of that for our agency specifically. Uh, and then we'd probably wanna to talk to our partners. We know that there are a number of peer agencies who have this type of policy and likely have some sort of agreement in place or verbiage somewhere that makes sure that this doesn't increase liability for, for the agency. Great. Um, I think we have time maybe for one more question or at time, if anyone has one more they want to put into the chat or the Q&A. Now I can ask a question that I was thinking. Um, has Wamada had conversations around using any of the infrastructure funding, federal infrastructure funding to support some of these recommendations in the future? That's a great question. We haven't explicitly, I know there are many folks within the agency that are having conversations about what that means moving forward. And I think that's a great point that this needs to be plugged to all of the people having those conversations is something that that could use some of that funding and, and would be a valuable use. But, but I haven't been a part of those discussions as of yet. It's a good reminder. Great. No, it's a it's critical critical issue to think about. Thank you all so much for, for all the research and the work on this. Um, I learned a lot. I think it was really 
fascinating conversation and a lot of uh, dialogue with everyone else. Just a reminder um, that at noon, we have another session on the path to community engagement, the road best traveled. And then at four o'clock today is our last session of the conference um, on land use law, where you can get your land use law credits. Um, and a, a final reminder that all of the pre-recorded sessions and all the sessions you may have missed earlier in the conference, there should be links now on our website to view the videos. And then after you view those, you can also claim credits for those. So um, thank you again, uh, Melissa, Nick, Lucas, um, great panel. And thanks everyone for attending um, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.